Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Brad Sherrill. I'm the director of the Cyclotron Laboratory here. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the EFRIP uh, Advanced Studies Gateway Saturday morning uh, physics lecture. The purpose of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to bring together researchers, scientists, thinkers, uh, musicians, artists, um, creative thinkers in general, like, like you from the community, um, to try to strengthen the connections between the EFRIP laboratory and, and the public and the broader community. So we're, we're really happy you're here to participate in this uh, Saturday morning talk. I'm also uh, very pleased and happy uh, that we have a guest from our uh, neighbor uh, university uh, in Mount Pleasant, uh, Central Michigan University. Um, and today's speaker is Professor Georgios uh, Perdikakis. Um, he hails from Athens originally. Uh, anyway, he did his uh, PhD work there um, at the uh, National Technical University of Athens. Uh, with uh, in ion beam uh, physics, and uh, besides studying nuclear physics, uh, he did uh, a lot of applications, and I guess his interest in uh, applications of uh, isotopes and beams has continued, but uh, I understand from the bio that he worked on uh, looking for toxins for the 2004 uh, Athens Olympics, uh, and also did uh, work on uh, creating uh, antimicrobial uh, films. Uh, that, uh, Quite, quite important. Um, but anyway, today he's going to tell us about his, uh, his research interests, and so we're very excited and very much looking forward to hearing about uh, life under blazing stars, supernova mysteries. So, Professor Perdikakis, welcome. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited to be here because uh, it's not very often that you get the opportunity to unfocus from, uh, from deep research and talk about something that is more broader, like the bigger picture. So, this is a great opportunity, I'm glad you guys are here. I will uh, start by talking about the picture that I have here on the background of my talk. And uh, if you thought that this is the moon, it is not. This is an event that happened about a millennium ago. It is the brightest, uh, the brightest event that appeared in the sky. Uh, that could be observed by naked eye, and it's a very bright supernova. It was so bright that uh, at the time, the Chinese uh, uh, people, that uh, uh, astronomers or astrologers that uh, observed it, um, thought that it was about uh, the brightness of the quarter of the moon. Also, they took it as a very good omen for the current emperor, and they were very happy about it. Um, this was not uh, the case for later supernovae that appeared. Uh, so, uh, 50 years later, more supernovae appeared in, uh, in the Milky Way. These were unfortunately related to plagues and other bad things. But this is not what we're talking about today. If, if these astronomers uh, were able to see this uh, supernova the way we see it today, they had telescopes, they would be able to see what has remained of this uh, supernova. And what you see here is a big cloud of gas and dust that is moving outside, still moving outside of this explosion. Uh, at, excuse me? It's like a nebula now. It is a nebula. Excellent. Yes, exactly. It is a nebula. And the nebula has gas and dust that goes out with uh, thousands of miles per second uh, speed. And uh, it is very important for us. Oops. One of the famous pictures of this kind of nebula is the Crab Nebula. And uh, this is made from another supernova. And I am showing you this picture because the color coding that they use for this composite picture corresponds to different uh, elements in the nebula. So wherever you see green, um, this corresponds to sulfur. Reddish hues correspond to oxygen. There should be some blue hues that I cannot see right now in this picture. But the red and blue correspond to oxygen. And what, what this means is that um, after this explosion, there was elements created. And these elements were dispersed in the interstellar medium. And then this nebula, after a long time, they tend to coalesce. And they, uh, they gra the, the, ma the matter gravitates towards each other. And they create dense uh, structures. So this is one of the most famous pictures of all times. Uh, this is called the Pillars of Creation. It's in, a, in another nebula, it's called the Eagle Nebula. 
and these structures here are condensed uh, gases that are going to give birth to new stars. And this is very, very interesting because when you make when this coalesce and co make new stars, um, whatever is left is going to be pieces of rock, and some of these pieces of rock are big planets, like ours. These are our, our favorite planets, right? And uh, that means that if I knew what the nebula contained, I would be able to know what is inside this rock. So geologists have studied this, and uh, we know quite well the, uh, the composition of the crust of the Earth. So if you look at the surface of the Earth, and you make a plot where you have here uh, different elements, we're using the atomic number, which means the number of protons, uh, to identify the different elements, but we have tags here with all the various uh, um, you know, uh, symbols for the elements. And this axis just tells you how much you have of each, and it is uh, normalized so that uh, silicon, which is a very important material that is contained in rocks, has about a million. And this is a long scale. Every time you, you drop down a notch, you drop several, several, uh, you divide by several times uh, by 10. So, it is, all, it, is, uh, it is normal to think that because we have so much of these rock forming elements, and then we have much less of these ones, and even less of these ones, this, this composition must, must affect our lives, right? And uh, here, I'll ask you a question. What do you think? What do you think was the material that the first really sharp knife was made? Wow. Obsidian. So obsidian? I don't know, yes. So, obsidian, here is an, a minimum of obsidian knives from, uh, uh, from the Maya. Looks like this. It's a very sharp, glass like uh, thing. It's basically a volcanic gas, glass, and we have mountains of it. This is a picture from uh, Lake Volcano in California, you see. This is uh, obsidian. And of course, obsidian is very important because, as we know, it's the only way to kill a white walker. I don't know if you are Games of Thrones fans. Um, but uh, this is for another talk. Okay. So, Obsidian is made, it's a glass, so it's made of silicon and oxygen and other stuff, but mostly these things, and you can find it almost everywhere, right? Um, so if you want to make a weapon back in the day, that's what you would use. The same thing you can say about art. The first, one of the first images of art in, uh, that we know of is uh, handprints. This is from a cave in France 24,000 years ago, and people would just take dirt or grindstone and mix it with... Uh, some liquid, probably the spit, and just making prints there, and they could make these pieces of art, right? And that was easy to do. But if you want to go to something more sophisticated, like this, uh, this uh, nice white that you see here in this uh, painting from Paestum in Italy, well, if you wanted to do that, you would have to have lead. This is the most uh, used, the, this is the white that's been used most in the world, so from the antiquity until the 19th century, and if you look here, you see that, okay, this is the handprints, this is lead, and this is several orders of magnitude different. And that means that uh, you need to have a process that you could take this from wherever it is, because it's not just on the ground, and take it out. And you can go further with this, with this uh, idea. So, here you see a map of uh, the Middle East region in the ancient times, and you see... This uh, legend shows you different types of, of uh, elements and where they you could find them. And uh, this is quite important uh, because uh, you see that in these areas you had elements like copper and tin and arsenic. Copper and arsenic, if you mix them together, you can make an alloy that makes very nice artifacts. You can make also some knives and some implements that you can use in everyday life. If you want to make, however, a weapon, you want to mix uh, tin with copper, and then you make tin bronze. And this is very, very sturdy and very well uh, behaved uh, alloy. And the lines that you see here is this, this yellow line is areas where people develop arsenical bronze, 
Well, this, this shadow here, this gray shadow, is where people were able to develop thin bronze for weapons. And where these two, two lines cross, I cannot believe it's a coincidence, but it's where the major empires of the old times uh, appeared. Right? These guys had everything. They had access to, to these uh, things, and they could make weapons and, and trade things. Actually, trade is very important, because if you wanted to get uh, copper and tin and gold, and you didn't have them where, you, where you're living, you would have to you know, expand and trade with other people. And this map shows you how civilization basically started from here, and metallurgy started spreading to the lighter regions over several millennia. So, the elements do matter for the advancement of civilization. So, tin is somewhere here, this is copper, uh, I'm trying to find zinc, there it is, all right. These are relatively rare. What about these ones, right? If these are difficult and make people travel distances, what about these guys, like gold and platinum and so on? Well, this uh, artifact shows a, a, shows a scene from, a, from a, a, a myth, a myth about a, a king that was uh, covering himself with, uh, with gold powder and immersing himself inside the lake. This is something that the Incas had as a legend. Initially it was called, I mean it was called El Dorado. You probably have heard the term. So it was like the, the gold covered person. Eventually, from mouth to mouth, this became a legend about the city of gold and an empire of gold. And you cannot imagine how much many people died in the Spanish and English Empire trying to find this thing. And they never did. And of course, if you were any person of import in, uh, in ancient times, you could show your power by having one of these very rare elements, right? King Tot, even after his death, he made a sarcophagus made uh, uh, out of solid gold, 20 pounds of gold, just to show that he's a commanding, uh, he's a, a, a commanding uh, person in life and in death. He also had a dagger, an iron dagger, where nobody else could have it, because nobody could smack iron into tools back then. He found this dagger from a meteorite, so he was calling it the star, and that was a symbol of his power. Okay, that is all stories, right? What about today? Today we want to have electric cars, we want to have electronics, we want to have uh, sophisticated technology, and for all that, we need rare earth metals, precious metals, and other stuff. And we get them from mines. This, this chart here shows you how the production of rare earth oxides that are used in, in electronics have uh, developed over the years. And you see that uh, the US was the leader of uh, mining of rare earth metals, but then at some point around the 80s and 90s, China started picking up. At some point, because of, uh, because of uh, basically um, the side effects of mining uh, this kind of ores and several accidents, we started ramping down our production. China continued ramping it up. And uh, now with this knowledge in mind, you can interpret a little bit, if you want, the trade wars that we currently have between, uh, between various uh, uh, powers. In the world. Actually, the U.S. is ramping up again the production of rare earths uh, because in 2010 we decided we were going to do it, and actually we are now mining again. Last application to, uh, to convince you that elements matter has to do with our planet. So the mantle of our planet was, not, uh, was initially molten, and uh, then eventually that it started cooling, and as it was started cooling, it created a single tectonic plate, and then it created the current plate tectonic. And uh, this is a very important thing, because the circle of heat in the planet uh, affects its uh, habitability. But how is this heated? So the, the way the mantle of the Earth is heated depends on the cocktail of radioactive isotopes that were present 
during the birth of, of uh, our planet 4.5 uh, um, billion years ago. So you see we have potassium-40, uranium-235, another uranium-238, to thorium. And as the time goes by, this heating drops based on the half-life of these elements. This is good to know for, for, uh, for, our, for our planet. I mean, our planet is safe. It's going to be warm for a long time. But it becomes even more interesting when we start thinking about space exploration and exoplanets. We have found now, this is a 2013 picture, and we have found about um, 1,000 confirmed exoplanets. Several of them, like hundreds of them, are uh, terrestrial type. And for these exoplanets, the heating and whether they are habitable will be depending on the, uh, on the, con on the concentration of these elements inside these, uh, these planets. So this, uh, this abundance of elements, the composition of our, of our solar system in elements, which you can see here in this picture, does really matter quite a lot. And uh, here you see again atomic number, but now this is for the whole solar system. We obviously have a lot of hydrogen, and this is the same abundance that I showed you earlier. And with the advances we have done in, in nuclear uh, astrophysics, we can now assign, we can now assign uh, different processes in the creation of those elements. Some of these uh, are made in the Big Bang. Big Bang created the elements after the very light ones. Then, uh, during the lifetime of stars, there are such particle reactions that create I I elements up to iron. But at that, at that point, we don't have, this is not energetically uh, favorable anymore. And all these other elements, including those ones that uh, we discussed that were uh, quite uh, uh, rare, are made in explosions. Now, in nuclear physics, you want to understand the picture that I showed you before. Let me back up one. You want to understand this picture I showed you before. We need to do a trick so that the elements give us some information about the elements. So, if I take this, this chart here and put it perpendicularly into that plot, and then I put another axis where I put the number of neutrons, then I have a two-dimensional plot. And this plot allows me to see which elements are stable, and which you see here with this, uh, these black uh, uh, squares, and also allows me to see isotopes of these elements, which means that uh, these are types of elements with different numbers of neutrons. So each line here will be uh, an element, but uh, each square will be an isotope. So all this uh, process that I showed you, nuclear physicists would like to uh, represent them in, in this map. And uh, the elements that were very rare were above uh, mass 30 are in this in this part in this part of the map. Now you don't need you don't need to remember all these processes, uh, but uh, the point is that. All these are uh, processes driven by nuclear physics. Our, our typical model of how a star dies and then uh, ex by exploding and how it creates uh, um, matter is the following. We have a, a large star that's typically about 10 times the, the size of our, the mass of our sun. And at some point towards the end of its life, this star has created, um, it looks like an orange, has created a lot of elements in the outside, it has hydrogen, it has helium, carbon, oxygen, and in the center, it has an iron core. At some point, as, as this uh, engine that creates elements uh, uh, works, and the star cannot anymore contain the gravitational force that tries to uh, collapse it. So this star starts <coughs> collapsing into its center, <coughs> and starts compressing at a very high speeds. All right? So when this happens, matter here in the center starts to become more and more compact. And at some point, 
it teaches uh, the maximum <coughs> compression that you can have. This is basically the, the, the density of a neutron matter. And in this case, the star bounces. So imagine something that is huge, 10 times the sun, falls into itself with a supersonic speed, then bounces and blasts uh, outside. And when this happens, a lot of neutrinos, um, which are very, uh, uh, there are particles that don't interact much, but very many of them <coughs> start getting emitted. And as the salt wave of this explosion moves out, and the neutron star is born, these neutrinos create some kind of wind that heats up the matter and makes, makes new materials. So, this is a very nice picture. It has one very important fundamental problem, practical problem. How do I know about this picture? So, the fundamental problem is that there is no way that a human can go and observe what happens in the center of the supernova explosion. So, basically, what we have to do is we have to we have developed this model based on observations. In the beginning, we had uh, only uh, observations with uh, little telescopes. Now we have uh, space telescopes with all sorts of uh, messengers, and we can create this. Uh, we can recreate these conditions. And it's a very big uh, uh, branch of astrophysics. How to actually simulate such a process? Now, this is a picture from uh, a paper, and pretty much the, this left side of the picture, you don't need to focus on it. it. The purpose of this picture is to show you that we can make a model of the shock wave and the neutrino driven wind, and then we can have, uh, and this is, you see, this is 2011, we can have simulations of how the gases inside the, uh, the star are behaving, how the temperature is, uh, is uh, changing, and from these conditions inside the star, we can uh, try to calculate um, what happens. This is a very, very important part, because we have not been able to do 3D simulations until we had very powerful computers. So this is something you cannot do in, in your laptop or in a, in a, big, in a computer like you, have, you can buy from the store. You need multi-million dollar computers to do it. And then, once uh, an astrophysicist does this kind of model, which basically gives us uh, how the temperature evolves, how the density evolves in the star, then we, as to, we physicists, nuclear physicists, will go and try to make a study where we put all the nuclear physics, react, all the nuclear reactions in there, and uh, try to see what comes out. So what I'm going to show you is a movie that one of my students made um, some time ago, and I'll play it back, but what you can see here, in this, in this plot you can see the temperature and the density of the star dropping as it explodes, and then in here you see how the matter is moving in the table of isotopes. And again, the black dots are the stable nuclei, this is neutron number, this is proton number, each row is an element. And in this pane, you see, with red, you see how the abundances look in our solar system, and this is what the calculation produces. So, let me play it once more. So you see how, in the explosion, the, the matter starts quickly spreading out, and then and a, lot, a whole lot of nuclear reactions are happening while it's uh, cooling down, and the matter is getting pushed away and away from this very, from this stable nuclei, and makes a big part of this chart. And then we can create, we can recreate uh, the abundances. So this is a movie, and it's a, it's a. It shows you how all the, all the work that needs to go in there to create these abundances. But the question is, how can we, how can we find all these nuclei? We can make um, reactions in a lab with uh, things that uh, are stable. But if we want to make uh, 
targets a nuclear reaction with something that is unstable, that is so far away from the line of stability, from materials and around us, we need uh, some different technique. And uh, the technique we have is we make beams of that. So what we want to do is we want to take these radioactive materials, generate them in a lab, and before they decay, we turn them into a beam. We don't make these fancy beams really, but I thought it was a good picture from a Lego movie. And uh, you're actually sitting in one of these facilities that make these beams. Actually, you're sitting in the facility that will make the best beams for the foreseeable future. And this is epic. This is a picture from the Eiffel Tunnel taken from when uh, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, beam was successfully accelerated. This is a uh, this this section that you see here is a big improvement in accelerator technology that would not have been possible unless we wanted to build and we want to start this problem. So you see here superconducting uh, cavities, the crime models that, ho uh, that host superconducting cavities, and uh, this is a unique facility, first of its kind, and. Uh, we are very happy to be here, and we are looking forward to the size that we will be able to do uh, with uh, the support uh, of the community. I think that is all I have to say. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn the lights up so we can see each other. <coughs> Hopefully that's not too bright. Um, do we have questions? <coughs> yeah, I had read a long time ago that, um, <coughs> I don't know if it still is current knowledge or not, that there's a, a limit where if a star is so big, up to this point, it will just go into like a um, red giant phase, but then above that line, it would become a supernova. There's a name for it. It's a I'm sorry? It's a <coughs> I, okay, I'm not an astronomer, I don't know the, the exact, uh, but oh. there is indeed a, a, a limit. Um, yeah, the sunshine limit is the limit of uh, being a black hole, I think, yeah. I don't know what's the limit for the red giant to a uh, neutron star. Um, but yeah, you're right, the star has to be um, 8 to 10 solar masses, we think, to be able to go supernova. Otherwise, it will, uh, like our sun, will become a red giant eventually. Okay. And, uh, and then above the from the supernova, then it goes to neutron. Well, from the supernova, depending on the mass of the star, you can either, when it collapses, can either become a neutron star, or if it's very heavy, very, has a lot of mass, it could collapse to a black hole. And then we don't get uh, 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 the neutron star. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, I don't have a science background, but I've learned a few things over the years. So, is it true that? All of the matter here on Earth has actually come from these exploding stars. Right. This is a, the, the um, a big question. We try to find the origin of the elements, and a big part of them comes from these explosions of, of the stars, yes. So, um, stars in the lifetime, they create, uh, they create uh, uh, elements, but... Uh, also, when they explode, this this matter is injected into the into the medium. So, so this is what we think is the is the current picture. So, some some of this happened in Big Bang. That the lighter elements happened during the Big Bang. Um, the heavier elements are mostly happening during uh, appearing during the explosion. Um, so others are just uh, created inside the star, and then they have to. There has to be some mechanism in which they get expelled into the, in the medium. Yeah, you're right. In that sense. Do black holes only emit gravity waves when they collide? Well, the black holes should be emitting. Uh, should be uh, should have a, a, a deformed the, the space-time already when by it existing, 
but uh, when they collide, they create this ripple that can be detected. Because this doctor in uh, Max Planck Institute in Garson, Germany, recently came out a paper where they discovered it. A black hole of 40 billion masses of the sun. Now, wouldn't that emit gravity waves continuously as it draws in more and more matter? This I don't know about this particular um, uh, black hole. I've heard uh, the news that there's a very massive black hole well, discovery, but I don't know what is the billion masses of the sun. Enormous, right? Enormous. Doesn't it? Thank you. Do you know why different elements emit different decays? Why different elements emit different decays? Well, it depends on how the protons and neutrons are structured inside the elements. And um, depending on where they are in the, in the chart, they might decay differently. So, um, for instance, elements that are in uh, this side of the chart, they will emit an electron and they will do what we say beta decay. The elements that are on this side of the chart have more protons than neutrons, will decay in a different way. They will maybe uh, emit a positron or absorb uh, an electron, capture an electron. Then, if we go to the limit of uh, this chart, there is a region where you cannot put any more uh, neutrons. And uh, we have discovered, uh, actually, in this lab, elements that emit uh, a neutron when they are, uh, these are very unstable elements that are. Uh, well, Probably some here. So it depends. There's also um, alpha emitting, uh, alpha emitting, alpha decaying uh, particles. And this has to do with uh, the potential, the, the energy distribution of uh, created by these uh, problems and neutrons. And then sometimes in a, you can imagine there are, you know, about fission perhaps, have you heard about fission, where a nuclear can break apart. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, you can think about it that the, the nucleus becomes so, gets such a weird shape yeah. that it makes more sense to break apart and uh, make two new ones. Yeah, because like some of um, the some elements around the um, atom <coughs> are 100 to 110 ish. Um, right. Those elements, um, a lot of them undergo spontaneous fission and then they start going back to alpha decays. Oh. Right. There's a, there's a, uh, so spontaneous fission you can have uh, also a bit uh, lower amount, but you're right, like uh, 90 something, you can start getting uh, spontaneous fission. And sometimes it competes with alpha decay. Yeah. Um, fission, for instance, is another Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What do you predict for our own star, the sun? Something along these lines? Is that what you predict? So, I, by reading about our sun, because I'm not I'm a nuclear physicist more than uh, I, I'm not really an astrophysicist, but from what I know about our, our sun, it has low enough mass that it will never go supernova. So it will eventually, <coughs> um, as it's burning the fuel, it will start creating uh, other elements, it will start enlarging, it will become a red giant eventually before it turns off. But this is billions of years away. Thank you. What? What, what parts of the uh, nuclear chart at this point have been um, experimented in the laboratory? And what parts are still just theoretical that we're trying to... At what point are we still doing the... This is what we expect to see in the our process decays, and we're going to test those with the effort moving forward. Right. So... You kind of see it here in this uh, picture. So, obviously, we have we have uh, we have uh, studied uh, quite a lot the stable nuclei. This is still going on on these ones, but then with the facilities that, like the current facility in SCL, we can go uh, a bit further out uh, on both sides. I don't have the plot that exactly shows where you can go, but. With effort, we assume that we could go closer to this uh, to this region here, where we start having this R process, and um, these are the big processes that uh, create the heavy elements. So, yeah, it's 
Okay. The, the yellow is what is known. Mm. Yellow yeah. is what is known right now, and green is what is predicted uh, to exist. Okay, so that the yellow is what we've seen and said, yes, we know these are the, the decays that have... Okay. And, and then is the purple line what we're expecting to be able to um, experimentally test? So the purple line is the arc process. No purple line. Unexpected. I mean, the arc process is not one line. Okay. It's an, uh, an expected arc process path, and F will give us access to most of those purple and process. <laughs> okay, so we have an audience member who's one of the people who discovered the neutron decay. <laughs> we have an additional expert. More, more questions or comments? Can I just ask it down? What does drip line mean? That's so cute. <laughs> yeah, the drip line is, is the region where you cannot add any more, uh, any more neutrons or any more protons. So okay. as we go and we create isotopes with more and more uh, Neutrons at some point, we know and have seen also experimentally that you cannot add any more. Um, it will not, uh, it won't be a stable system anymore. It's not, yeah, it's not really a saturation, but it's just, you cannot have a. They don't stick. They don't stick, yeah. They don't stick. The same for the server. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know who came up with that term. I don't know. Been around for a long time. Yeah, right. <coughs> Anything else? I'm sure uh, Professor Perdicapas is willing to stick around for a little while. So if you, if you have any more burning questions or want to uh, ask me more, I'm sure he'll be here if you want to come on down and talk to him. But anyway, thank, thank you all very much for being here, and uh, let's thank our speaker one more time. <laughs>